fourth annual Chanini Kumar lecture on Asian Americans and activism. I know this is a very different format from what you're used to, but yeah, I am thrilled to have our speaker today, uh, Neil Saxena, who I will introduce in a bit. But first off, uh, it's my honor to, to introduce Chanini Kumar. So Chanini Kumar currently serves as a supervisory attorney in the Overseas Citizen Services Office of the U.S. Department of State. She was previously appointed to the U.S. Foreign Service and served as a diplomat overseas before returning domestically in 2014. She has worked as a Hill staffer, an assistant state's attorney in Montgomery County, and as a private litigation attorney. Her interests outside of work include travel, Middle Eastern dance, and spending time with her husband and two boys, twin boys. She earned her JD at American University in 2004. Ms. Kumar is a proud Terp, having earned her BA in government and politics, as well as a certificate degree in women's studies from UMD in 2000. So let's give a warm UMD AST welcome to Chanani Kumar. Good evening, everyone. I am honored to welcome you here virtually to the fourth annual lecture in a series on Asian Americans and activism and to present a student impact award to a student who has made an exceptional contribution related to meaningful action in the Asian American community. While my husband Raj is on child distraction duty tonight, uh, we both want to extend our sincere gratitude to the faculty and staff of Asian American Studies, particularly Dr. Terry Park, who has led this event since its inception, for arranging a virtual lecture here tonight um, in the midst of a pandemic that has affected each one of us in different ways. We can focus this evening on being inspired and energized in, in an otherwise incredibly difficult time. Our speaker tonight was a contemporary of mine at UMD back in the 1990s. Um, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome him here and hope that his experience will encourage many of you to take the leap down the nonprofit path despite its challenges. AAST and classes in Asian American studies have certainly served as the springboard for so many of us in our various career paths. And I am forever grateful for that. I am thrilled that AAST's lecture series can complement dedicated academic studies and provide the opportunity to hear how the fire of community activism can stoke a successful future career. So thank you again, AAST, for arranging this wonderful program tonight in these unprecedented times and to all of you for, for joining us here. Thanks. All right, thanks for that introduction. And I forgot to introduce myself. So for those of you who don't know me or you've never taken a class with me, I am Dr. Terry Park um, and I'm a, I'm a lecturer in the AST program. And it's been great to oversee this uh, Kumar lecture on Asian Americans and activism. Uh, but before we get to Neil uh, first, it is my pleasure to honor uh, and award our fourth uh, Student Impact Award winner. Uh, before I mention his name, um, I'll uh, list a few of his uh, many accomplishments, the different ways in which he has impacted the Asian American community, both on campus as well as off campus. Uh, and just to let folks know, we received uh, a, a, a good number of amazing applications from a number of student activists and it's just really heartwarming to see uh, the work, uh, the impact that so many of our minors and Asian American students have on campus. Uh, but this student, um, and I'm just gonna list a few things among the many uh, accomplishments and experiences that he's had. Uh, he has helped, um, or he interned at the Maryland General Assembly where he organized an event for AAPI Heritage Month uh, he currently serves as an intern at UC Davis's Bulasan Center for Philippine X Studies. Shout out to UC Davis, uh, where I got my PhD, um, and is co-leading a workshop on Philippine X human rights for that center's uh, research conference. 
He served as the Vice President of Administrative Affairs for the Asian American Student Union. And among the many things he's done with ASU, he uh, pushed ASU towards greater cooperation with SGA, uh, including uh, an a ASU sponsor of an SGA ticket for the first time ever. Uh, and he also helped uh, create, jointly create an APEDA legislative con uh, caucus, an effort that he, along with uh, the current co-presidents, spearheaded in solidarity with the South Asian Student Association and other APEDA student organizations. He serves on a number of committees, I think more committees than I serve on, uh, representing ASU and AAST, uh, including the undergrad graduate dean student advisory council. So it is our uh, privilege and honor to award this year's AAST, AAST Student Impact Award to Patrick Peralta. Let's give him a round of applause. And I think uh, I can actually share screen the certificate. Uh, folks can see, there you go. Congratulations, Patrick. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Park. I just wanna uh, say a few words. Uh, I, I wanna thank uh, Asian American Studies Department, which has been such a home for me uh, in discovering my Asian American identity. And also I just wanna give a brief uh, thank you to uh, the Asian American Student Union and the rest of uh, my friends on the executive board uh, for empowering me to be such a, a, a student leader that I am now, so thank you. Congratulations, Patrick. Yep, congratulations again, Patrick. Um, all right, so let's get to our main speaker for today. Neil Saxena is a leader, collaborator, advocate, fundraiser, and currently chief advancement officer at Fair Chance. His 20 years in and leading national and local nonprofits and local government centered in issues on youth development, equity, language access, and nonprofit capacity building. He serves on the board at the Asian Pacific American Film Festival in DC. His language access, census, and Asian American advocacy has been recognized by local governments. A son of Indian immigrants, partner, father, Neil has degrees from UMD and American University. Let's give another round of applause, a warm welcome to Neil Saxena. Thank you, Terry, and thank you, Chani, Julie, and Jessica for coordinating this, and Patrick, congratulations. Um, I am excited to be here with you all this evening. Um, again, my name is Neil Saxena. I come to you via video from the occupied territory of the Patawomac people who have stored this land for generations. Um, I am wearing a blue blazer, red shirt in a room with um, some a background wall. Um, I prefer pronouns or he, him, and his. Um, I'm excited to share my nonprofit journey with you all in hopes that you too will find your way to the nonprofit space. Um, Tonight, I want to just share um, a description of uh, my nonprofit story and hope that my suggestions help in your decisions. Um, I've included in my presentation tonight some photos by Corky Lee, um, who is considered uh, the unofficial photographer of the Asian American uh, movement. And I've included them in remembrance and honor of his um, work. And happy to share this presentation afterwards. Um, I have not cited the photos yet, so once I do that, I um, am more than happy to share them with everyone. Um, so tonight, what I wanted to do is share kind of how we're going to go through this journey together. I'm going to talk a little bit about how did this whole nonprofit journey start, give some context. Um, once you get into a nonprofit, um, so you've applied, you've got in, now what? Um, what does it mean um, to work in a nonprofit? Um, then I want to talk a little bit about uh, leading a nonprofit and what that means. And so if you've worked in a nonprofit, um, the idea that you're kind of going from the sibling to the parent. Um, and then at the end, really share some just insights from my experiences um, working in different nonprofits. Um, so I'm going to start off with this idea of 
my journey to Asian American excellence. Um, for about half of my life, I always wanted to be white. Um, and it wasn't until I got to uh, University of Maryland and took an Asian American studies class where I saw people um, who had similar experiences to me, um, not just within my Indian American community, but outside. Um, and this idea of a collective Asian American um, identity it was really forged in um, my time at the University of Maryland, particularly in um, the one Asian American studies class that I had um, available to me at the time. It was called Asian Americans and Public Policy um, by Professor Phil Nash. Um, and so how I got there is I, I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood. Um, we lived with uh, two different families um, throughout time. Um, and something interesting is uh, I experienced philanthropy my whole life. Um, and I think a lot of us experience philanthropy, but just in a different way that's not um, the mainstream definition. Uh, my parents would help out different families or collectively we would help out different families by collecting money, by collecting food, collecting clothes. Um, and this was a sort of mutual aid um, that we all, um, that I experienced um, as I was uh, growing up. Um, once I got to the University of Maryland, uh, like I said, I, there was one class um, um, that I could take. Um, there were, I think there was a couple other classes offered. I just didn't, couldn't fit it in my schedule. Um, and so for me, a lot of the education towards Asian American excellence um, came from dialoguing with peers, um, reading on my own, um, engaging in different conversations. Um, and I want to share this idea of Asian American excellence. It's not it's an idea that's that's based in community. Um, and so for me, um, and striving towards that is also about uplifting others. Um, and one of the ways that I found I'm able to do that is working in nonprofits. Um, and so there are many different types of nonprofits out there. Um, hospitals are nonprofits, um, some of some big um, uh, international groups are, are nonprofits. Um, but what I want to really talk about here are community-based nonprofits, and that's where my experience um, is. And those are organizations um, that work at the local level um, to improve the life of residents. Um, most of the time, these groups are the trusted messengers within the community. They come from the community. Um, the, their leaders do, their staff do, the, folk, the folks who are volunteering. Um, so it's very much based in um, interpersonal um, actions, working on issues like youth development, um, food insecurity, um, housing. Um, the typical structure is there is a board of directors um, who oversee and ensure the organization is running well. Um, and they oversee an executive director who then oversees um, staff. Uh, one of the interesting things about these community-based uh, nonprofits is uh, local governments have used nonprofits as one of the ways that they address poverty. And so they do that through different grant programs, providing um, grants so that uh, nonprofits can provide potentially clothing or um, housing assistance or different, uh, different types of supports um, for uh, families and communities um, around, around the country. Um, something also, um, 10% of all private jobs in the US are nonprofit. Um, so I think a lot of people think, you know, nonprofits don't contribute as much to the economy, um, but having 10% of jobs um, is a significant portion uh, of the economy. I mentioned a little bit before about philanthropy. So nonprofits are funded in a way where uh, individual donors, foundations and governments um, provide grants or funding to run a variety of programs. Um, and one of the things I wanted to highlight is many community-based organizations um, uh, who are led by Black, Indigenous, people of color um, really lack access to this funding. Um, and that is due to many systemic barriers um, that are placed in front of these nonprofits led by um, BIPOC individuals. Um, so moving on, um, now that you're in a nonprofit, um, and so I, what I want to do is share kind of my experience, 
um, share, you know, kind of how I felt um, in the nonprofit space. Um, and then what were some of the lessons um, that I learned? So my experience started, I started off as a volunteer. Um, I was a mentor to a young person at a nonprofit, uh, then went on to become a full-time staff working on uh, programming um, over for summer programs for uh, low-income Vietnamese youth. Uh, and then I took some time um, to also get into grant writing. Um, and so those were my three first experiences um, working in a nonprofit. I remember coming in thinking, I've taken an Asian American studies class. Um, you know, I, I knew a lot of things, so I kind of knew how to do this work. Um, you know, no one could really tell, I knew better than the people who were there. Um, I've done uh, some, you know, advocacy on campus. Um, and I thought very highly of myself coming into the nonprofit space. I also thought I had a lot of passion and, and love for the community and that would overcome any kind of skill uh, learning that I would need to do. So I maybe wouldn't uh, take advantage of a training or an opportunity because I'm like, well, I, I, you know, I've, I've done so much in the community, so that will get me through. Um, one of the things um, that also was a challenge for me is, um, you know, growing up, I was always taught to, to give deference to elders. Um, and so the, the challenge became is, is in, in, in this space, um, how do I challenge those who were in leadership who were older than me and how do I navigate that? Um, that was a big challenge for me. So when I did feel like something was not working, um, I struggled, um, you know, culturally to, to find how do I approach this? Um, the other piece um, is I didn't have the language in uh, how to uh, communicate um, in a professional setting. Uh, most of my experience um, was not with professionals. Um, and so, you know, it was a challenge of not having the language um, there um, to work. Um, and so what did that lead to? I always felt included, but I never felt like I belong. Um, and that was a, a big issue. And so I, I got to thinking, what am I trying to belong to? Um, you know, I think one of the things that really gave perspective is, is re-engineering this idea of belonging from belonging to the organization to belonging to the community um, or the people who are with me, um, so my peers. Um, so really bringing it back um, to centering my perspectives uh, on community. So not to the institutions, um, but to the people who made up those institutions. Um, one of the other things that was um, interesting and, and I um, was sharing this earlier today, um, and I mentioned um, Phil Nash, um, the professor for, for um, the class I took and, um, you know, he described his experience, um, you know, working at a nonprofit and, you know, he talked about, you know, when I was at a nonprofit, I got to um, help with Japanese redress. Uh, and then when I got to my nonprofit, I was moving boxes. Um, I was, um, putting computers together. Uh, I was doing some programming. I was like, well, wait a second. This is not what nonprofit life is like. Um, what, what I failed to check in with uh, Professor Nash about is, you know, what is the whole picture of the nonprofit? Um, why, why, what was Phil doing in the other times um, when he wasn't um, testifying in front of uh, Congress? Um, and why? why? Why were these nonprofits um, having staff, you know, do all these different things? Um, and and, and what, it, what it really taught me is that there are systems in place um, that challenge the nonprofits from being able to raise enough to have a separate person um, to do all the things. And so um, as you go in, you, you might be asked to do a lot of different things. Um, and you might um, not see another, another way out. Um, like I said, one of the things that I, nav how I navigated that was really centering, okay, well, you know, this institution is asking me, this organization is asking me to do all this stuff. I'm getting upset. It's not what I signed up for, um, but why am I really here? Uh, you know, I'm here for 
helping and supporting for whatever cause or whomever community that um, that I wanted to come for. And so thinking through, you know, how can I stay there? Um, the other thing that was um, was helpful is is finding belonging with my peers um, in the nonprofit space. So whether that was in my own organization or with other organizations or peer organizations. So just having a conversation where we can talk and connect over um, the challenges that we're facing and just at least uh, vibe around, uh, you know, what was going on. Um, so um, moving on. Um, so I, I stayed in the nonprofit space for some time and, um, you know, I, I learned a lot. I, I um, was part of, in, in many nonprofits, there are kind of three main areas. Um, there's like the operations, you know, the accounting, making sure all the lights are on. Um, then you get a development area, which is uh, kind of raising the funds for the organization and then the programmatic. Um, and so I spent time in all three areas. And over time, um, you know, an opportunity came about to become an executive director. Um, and so I thought, you know, I've been in nonprofits for so long. Um, I saw things that, that worked in leadership. I saw things that I would have changed in leadership. Um, so this is perfect. I can definitely do it. Um, I have uh, the experience of you know, doing the work on the ground um, to doing the middle management work to now leading so people will really connect to me. Um, and what I found is you know, I was a sibling. I was like the big brother first you know, when I was staff. And then I became the parent. And so um, people interacted with me differently and I had to come to grips with that. Um, you know, where before I would go out and have a drink after work with everyone, but now, but now I'm the boss. Um, and so there's a different dynamic. And so navigating through that dynamic uh, was something that was important. One of the, one of the biggest things that, that helped me in my leadership is, um, is really I had to take an inventory of my privilege and trauma that I would be bringing into the position. Um, and so I really had to look at um, where have I benefited um, from different systems and where, where do I have access um, and how my experience, my life experiences, um, my immigrant experiences, my parents' experiences have impacted the trauma and what would be some of those barriers um, as I come into this space uh, of being a leader. And that really helped provide context as I went into um, this leadership role. Um, and so I got in, felt good, you know, kind of knew where I was coming from, knew all these different things. Um, one of the things that, that still stuck with me um, was feeling like an imposter among imposters. Um, so this idea that, of an imposter syndrome, um, it, you know, where that you don't feel, you don't have that confidence uh, in the position that you have and, you know, when you become an executive director, I think the title brings a lot. Um, yeah, I didn't maximize that. I still felt like, you know, I'm not an executive director. I'm still a director of something. Um, and so the challenge really came about, uh, came in confidence. Um, the other side is as Asian Americans, we're, we're not often told about our leadership or our leadership isn't highlighted. And so I always struggled with um, am I even a good leader? Are my decisions making sense? Um, you know, how, who are, I, I have no one else to rely on but myself now. Um, before I had peers. And so if I was a program person, I could ask the other person say, hey, what are you doing here? Um, but now, you know, in, in the hierarchical structure of the nonprofit um, that I was in, I was it. Um, so if I made a decision, you know, I had to live with it. And so um, that, that was a big, um, a challenge for me. Um, and, and just, and then not seeing other Asian American, um, leaders, something unique for me, um, that I experienced is, is I navigated mostly Asian American nonprofits and spaces. And I saw actually very few, um, uh, during my experiences time of Asian Indians being in those spaces. Um, during the time that I was in some groups, it was mostly East Asian. And so I often was the only person or um, the first person and often expected to 
uh, bring that perspective, um, not just for Indian Americans, but actually for all South Asians. Um, and so that also put some pressure of, uh, on me in, in, in thinking through isolation. Um, and, and I think the last part is, um, uh, in, in terms of a challenge, a leadership challenge is, um, you know, you're able to navigate your own group and in your own organization and, and working with other Asian Americans, you can navigate um, and support each other. Uh, maybe there are different ways uh, you can think about leadership in there. Um, what becomes uh, a challenge um, is going out into philanthropic spaces. So as an executive director, part of your role is to raise funds. And most of those funds, uh, particularly in the DC area are with um, white light, white led foundations and, and white donors. Um, and so how do you navigate those spaces? And I had to think back through um, this idea of isolation and, and being alone and, and how do, how could I take the deficits that I thought I had growing up where maybe I wasn't included in all the things that other kids were doing and how did I navigate those um, spaces? Um, you know, I wasn't invited to all the birthday parties. Um, and, and at that time it felt very isolating. Um, but I had experienced this before, right? And so, you know, I was prepared actually to, to feel this isolation. Um, and I had to think back of how did I navigate those, those, those experiences. Um, and so when I would go to an event like that where I didn't really connect, I would go in not to build connections necessarily, but to get a job done. And so I'd go and meet with the funders I needed to meet with, um, made sure that um, I did what I needed to do to maintain those relationships. And then I would go on my way, um, not staying in those spaces to potentially encounter comments or, um, or actions or questions um, that would make me feel uncomfortable and make the whole situation a challenge and wouldn't then benefit the organization that I was leading. Um, and so I talked a little bit about the struggles and, and, and one of the, a couple of things of how I navigated this is um, I really found a group of fellow Asian American executive directors to talk to. Um, this is from different conferences that I would go to, um, different meetings, and we just all would stay in touch. We all had similar experiences. Um, and so we would do regular um, video chats. Um, interestingly enough, now all we do is video chats, but um, we would just do video chats with each other and talk about, you know, what we were experiencing. And that was it, that we weren't looking for a solution, but there's value in sharing your experiences. Um, the other thing inside the organization is I really looked at distributive leadership. And so I had a leadership team and we share responsibilities. Um, and that helped with um, this idea of moving from the sibling to parent, uh, where I was able to rely more on um, other folks. Um, and then I think the other part of having confidence in your decision making. Um, so a big thing for me was, you know, the decisions I make, what if they don't get the same outcome that I need? Um, what if it's a challenge um, that comes up? One thing that I learned is that, that your decision is one part of the equation. Um, there's so many other factors that go into it and, and you can't control everything. And so I had to find and honor that the information that I had, um, I'm able to make a decision um, that, that maximized uh, everything that I was uh, provided and given. Um, so um, these are a couple of things um, that um, that I learned along the way um, uh, and that were um, things that had helped me um, in, in my growth in the nonprofit space. So um, this first thing, actually, I um, have to give credit. I'm part of a um, BIPOC um, fundraisers group. Um, and so this term came up, a code switch vacation. So it's not my own term. Um, but this is basically as, as people of color, we're often in spaces where we're always code switching. We're always, you know, explaining uh, uh, why some things happen or, um, you know, not sharing the full story. And, um, and so one of the things that's helpful is, is finding a space where you can talk about work where you don't have to code switch, where you don't have to change your language. You can, you can 
um, you know, bring your full self and be honest uh, about uh, what that looks like. Um, next is something, um, you know, a lot of times when you're when you're in a nonprofit and 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 this happens uh, maybe in the entry point is when you are um, you're there and all your friends may be in um, in the corporate world and, and you feel lonely um, or there's an experience that they're 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 able to experience um, that you aren't or in leadership you feel lonely. I think one thing to remember is that you're not alone. Um, I think you'll find find times of loneliness, um, but there are communities out there in nonprofits, um, peers or leaders, um, and I urge you to seek out those. Um, this next one is is kind of minding the leadership gap. You know, one of the one of the biggest challenges um, that comes up with leadership as a nonprofit staff or as a leader is there's going to be generational gaps. Um, you know. As a leader now, many of the people who are coming in um, to to work um, with me, um, on, you know, in re in reality, kind of were born when I graduated high school. Um, so there's an obvious obvious gap in in, in the generation. It's important for um, all of us, I think, you know, both as a leader and as staff, to think through, you know, how can I navigate and communicate um both ways um and i think there's a lot to learn um once we keep that openness uh and communication uh moving forward um and the last piece um you know we get we get wrapped up in this work a lot um and i think it's important to understand um the systems that are in play um and, and those systems also include um you know connections with other communities um one of the things, um, as as I've spent most of my time working um, in and with Asian American communities, is understanding um, the impact on um, on Black communities and how that has impacted um, the Asian American community. And um, thinking through, you know, my fight and my work and advocacy in Asian American communities, um, how can I also be an accomplice within um, uh, you know, with, with Black communities in fighting for uh, racial justice. Um, and so as you navigate Asian American spaces, uh, kind of keeping mind of there are bigger systems at play for some of the things that happen in nonprofits, um, but also overall with all, all communities of color. Um, and with that, I will end. Um, thank you for sharing this space with me. Um, this is one of my favorite photos of um, Corky Lee, and I will be sure to um, provide the credit of where this came from um, when I send this out. Um, so with that, I will just turn it back to Terry. All right, let's give Neil a virtual or physical round of applause for that really uh, inform informative and honest account of what it means to be an Asian American leader in nonprofit spaces. And I was also thinking there were lessons I learned uh, that I think could be applied to not other sorts of spaces, not just nonprofit spaces. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Neil, uh, for sharing your experiences and wisdom and challenges and uh, so now we have a Q&A. Um, and as I typed into the chat box, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A function. And there's already one question lined up. And I'll read them off uh, for Neil, because uh, I don't think you can see the, the Q&A um, the questions. So okay. yeah, I'll uh, read them off. Um, so first off, we have a question from uh, Tuan Nguyen. Oh, and I also wanted to mention, I really appreciated the inclusion of Corky's photos. So again, for those who don't know, Corky Lee uh, recently passed away from COVID um, and his photographs, his presence, I mean, he was everywhere. <laughs> uh, every Asian American event, big and small, you saw Corky documenting uh, a lot of us and making us feel that we were seen for the first time. And so um, 
I'm glad that you honored Corky's work and legacy. And speaking of Phil Nash, um, he just wrote a great essay about uh, the legacy and significance of Corky's work uh, through the Smithsonian. So um, check that out. Maybe I'll drop the link in the box. Um, oh, good. We have a second question. So first question, what did you enjoy the most and least on your journey? Uh, and uh, they say, thank you for all you do for the community. And thank you, Chanani, for your sponsoring the lecture series. Thanks. Uh, I think the most is the people, the people that I got to work with. Um, you know, I think the, the work uh, and in many nonprofits, the work is always fulfilling uh, in many nonprofits, but it's really the people that I got to connect with, the lifelong friendships um, that I uh, made working in nonprofits. Um, and I think what what I didn't like I think the least um, is probably, um, I don't know, I, I guess when I, I did fundraising for a while, um, and so kind of sometimes meeting people when I didn't want to meet people. Um, you know, I, I, I consider myself an introvert. And so kind of, you know, going out and in the hustle of, of fundraising, um, was a challenge. All right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, we have a second question from one of my students, Brandon, Brandon Kim. Uh, he says, fantastic presentation. My question is during your early le leadership roles, and this could apply generally, were there programs or events you planned or thought about that you are especially proud of? Um, so, so I think um, I think some of the work came about. Um, well, I, th I think uh, at, when I was at Maryland, there was a lot of stuff I was proud of and, and, and things that I do. And I, I consider that um, community work. One of the, um, one of the things that, that gave me confidence um, is being able to do a project in an Asian American studies class um, and taking that work and applying it. Um, and, and, the, it was a, it was a group project. Um, everyone loves group projects. Um, and so we did a group project and then we said, well, why can't we actually go to the director of student services and, and try and implement this? Um, and so I, so I, I would say projects and experiences where you can take things from the classroom and apply them, um, are one of the most fulfilling things, uh, and opportunities, um, you know, when you're in, in, in the educational space, you might feel, well, can I actually use this in the, in the real world? What are the real world applications for this? Um, and so I think that is something that, that I'm really proud of is being able to take things that I learned um, from the University of Maryland and apply them in the real world. And uh, that sort of applied knowledge definitely happens in a lot of our AST classes, a lot of community engaged work with nonprofits uh, in the DC DMV area. Uh, all right, some more questions um, from Phil Nash himself. He says, excellent talk. What extra tips would you have for APA women going into nonprofit leadership? Well, Phil, I'm not sure. I'm super qualified to answer that question, but I, I can share this. Um, my experience is I've worked uh, predominantly with um, Asian American women in nonprofits. And the biggest challenge um, that I've encountered when we've engaged in meetings is still um, pervasive misogyny at, um, at levels of leadership within nonprofits um, and philanthropy or nonprofits and meetings. Um, there'll be times where I would be sitting with my, um, my supervisor in a meeting and they would only talk to me. Um, and so I, I'm not sure I can give advice um, for women, but I can give advice um, for those who identify as, as, as male is, um, you know, speak up in those situations. Um, you know, in those times, I would say, listen, I'm not the boss. You need to talk to this person. Um, I think that is a challenge. I think the other one is, is 
in nonprofits, in philanthropy. Um, there's a lot of social situations where um, women have a, have a more have a, a greater challenge in connecting. And I think it's showing up and calling out behaviors um, are two ways that I think um, you can be supportive um, in those situations. Thank you for that answer, Neil. And uh, speaking of Phil, um, in the Q&A chat, hopefully you saw that I dropped the link to our program website where you can access Phil's really moving essay on the work of Korhili. Um, all right, next question from Janelle Wong, one of our core faculty members, former director of AST. She says, thank you, Neil, what a great talk. I love the conceptualization of working in the nonprofit world as being a way to achieve Asian American excellence. And her question is, how has COVID affected the nonprofit sector? It seems like there will be an important role given the major inequalities deepened by the pandemic, but are there major changes related to the funds flowing to nonprofits, ability to hire and job security? Yeah, so um, I think there's an organization called Candid that just did a study on uh, nonprofits and found in particular the Washington DC nonprofit area is going to be hit the hardest um, of, of all communities. Um, I don't recall all the factors that went into their study, but um, I think that is something that has has come out. Um, I, I, I think laying out that context um, is important. I, the other comparison to this time is after 9-11, um, a lot of nonprofits were also hit hard. Um, and most of that had to do with um, pulling back of government, local government funding um, which is impacting nonprofits. Um, and so what, what we're seeing now though is hard because the federal government is providing support um, for payroll. Um, they provided last year and they provided this year. So we're not gonna see um, as, as large of an impact, but once that funding starts to move away, we're gonna see local governments pull back their funding. Uh, we're gonna see significant challenges with nonprofits having to have to close um, or merge together. Um, and in, at the end of the day, the challenge that comes out is communities will be impacted negatively. Um, we will see um, new nonprofits sprout up um, and, and that happened after 9-11 as well, um, places closed. One of the things that I encourage everyone to look at is, um, is this idea of mutual aid. Um, as nonprofits are struggling, uh, particularly in DC, each DC is, is, is broken up into eight ward. Each ward has different mutual aid networks and there are groups of individuals and nonprofits um, who are working together to support community needs. So whereas before a nonprofit might be that entity that does that, um, you know, communities are preparing for what's gonna happen and these mutual aid networks uh, are becoming more prevalent. Um, where they're able to distribute food, distribute whatever is needed, provide information of where to get a vaccine, um, maybe even talk through um, with certain communities that are scared of taking vaccines because of long histories um, that have perpetuated um, health inequities against them. And so um, they're the ones who are gonna be able to message um, that with those communities. Um, and so, so I think it's going to be a challenge, um, you know, really in 2022 is where we're going to see significant challenges um, with nonprofits um, in, in their sustainability. Now, I just have a quick follow up question. Um, I was just wondering what you thought of the Biden administration's recent executive memo. Um, uh, uh, talking about anti-Asian racism in this current uh, pandemic and how they recognized the need to work with Asian American community leaders. Do you think, or what do you think that will have, uh, or what kind of impact do you think that'll have on funding, federal funding uh, for Asian American nonprofits? Uh, Terry, I actually, I actually think it's gonna have an impact on 
local dollars and local philanthropic dollars because it uplifts it uplifts a message that is not from an Asian American organization. And I think the reality still comes out where, um, you know, it's Asian Americans are always talking about this, talking about this. And, and I think it sometimes falls to deaf ears for decision makers. And so, you know, just as I talked a little bit about as Asian Americans, we have a certain privilege as people of color um, where we can gain access into certain spaces that other people of color can't um, because they have barriers and they've pitted us against each other. I think similarly in this case, um, the administration has shared a narrative that, um, that affirms the messaging um, that nonprofits and communities have, have been saying um, to bring back to philanthropic organizations, to bring back to decision makers. Like this is actually a problem. We're not just saying it. Um, this is not an isolated incident. Um, this is pervasive. And, you know, we can now share some more information with you uh, about what this looks like. Um, and so I think that's, that's where we'll, there'll be a great impact on, um, on what they've produced out there. Thank you for that. Um, so going back to the Q&A, uh, Busaba Tantisan Thorn says, hello, AST alum here. Uh, can you please talk a little bit about the systemic issues that impact funding for nonprofit organizations led by uh, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color? Yeah, so I think um, I I think I mentioned I took um, I looked at my privilege first when I became an executive director, and, and my privilege is. Um, is, is in part class that I can afford to be a nonprofit e executive director. Um, and, you know, part of that is I've had certain opportunities um, being male, um, you know, being lighter skinned within the Asian American community, uh, Asian Indian, so the colorism. And so I have more opportunities potentially have opened for me. Um, and, and I think that, um, plays out in nonprofit spaces. And so white leaders have, um, you know, potentially more access. Um, they're able to, um, maybe those who have taken on leadership roles can, um, they might not, they may be able to not take a paycheck for a couple of months because they have generational wealth um, that they can rely on. Whereas uh, a BIPOC leader may not. Um, They've been uh, shown and supported in leadership throughout their whole life that you are a leader, you can be a leader, this is what a leader looks like. Um, they're given opportunities for trainings and, and things like that, where um, in school, you know, maybe uh, the BIPOC young people weren't selected by the teacher to run for SGA, um, right? So they don't have that experience. Um, there. And so those are kind of the experiences internally. And then I think from a funding standpoint, they don't have those same relationships. So while I talked about it as a benefit of going to funding meetings and just hitting the points, the people that I needed to, to maintain funding, I wasn't developing new relationships. And so if I lost that funding, that's all I had. Um, and so I wasn't part of that network. I wasn't going out to have a drink afterwards with them um, to negotiate and talk about support and funding there. Um, and so I don't have that access. Um, I don't have that connection. Um, and so I think that is another place um, where, um, where we'll come out. And then I think that the last piece is um, this idea of to run a nonprofit costs money. Um, so you still have to pay rent, you still have to do all these other things. Um, you know, the, the dollars that are given to those organizations don't necessarily include all of that. Um, and so you're given money just for your direct services, but you still have to pay for health insurance. You still have to pay for all these different things. And so if you can't afford to pay for health insurance for your staff and they get sick, then you have no staff, right? Because they're all sick. Um, and so you have a system in place that's just giving you money for programs, um, but not taking care of or giving you enough to pay for health insurance or retirement or feeling secure and safe. Um, and so I think those are some of the challenges, systemic challenges um, and how they play out um, at, 
at the level of staff and, and leadership. Great, thanks for that. And uh, I now see a whole bunch of questions now in the Q&A chat box, which is great. Um, we have about nine, 10 minutes left though. So uh, I'm gonna skip around and ask um, not every single question, unfortunately. Uh, but I think this next question might tie into what you just talked about, some of the, the concrete examples you gave about these challenges of funding. Uh, David too asks, what were your experiences like with Asian American lead? Um, were, were the things you said about being an imposter applied to that organization? Um, and as an AA lead alumni, it's really good to see you again, Neil. Oh, good. <laughs> um, good to see you too. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's um, I would say many nonprofit leaders feel like imposters in, in kind of the leadership space. Um, when we generally speaking, talk about leaders, we don't think of nonprofit leaders, right? We always are like a corporate leader or uh, a politician is, is our leaders. And so I think already there is a level of, am I really a, a leader um, here um, in nonprofit spaces? There's a lot about leadership, but, you know, and I don't know this, um, but if you take a leadership class, I don't know if they, just on leadership, how many of the people are nonprofit leaders? How many are leading a community-based organization? You might get more politicians and maybe even celebrities. Um, and so I think, I think within that space, there's already a challenge. Um, and then I think in that space, I felt like, um, and, and a lot of it was everyone, when I would go to these nonprofit leader meetings, you know, it would be me and maybe one other, you know, um, person of color. And so we'd all go hang out with you. I said, hey, you're the only other person here. Um, and so we would go hang out with each other and just not, not connect and not be part of this community. Uh, of nonprofit leaders. And I think that's where the, that's where it built. Um, it's feeling like, like we're not part of this. We're the separate group. Um, so we don't belong here. Um, and I think that's where part of the imposter syndrome uh, or the imposter feeling came about. Um, and that particularly came when I was at Asian American Lead when I would go out to different meetings. Um, and I would either be the only one in the room or one of two people in the room. Great, and uh, that actually answers a couple of other questions asking, how do you deal with isolation or uh, feeling like an imposter? And I think what you said, finding your people, right? Um, hanging out, getting a drink after work and finding those connections, venting, um, I think is helpful. Uh, I think this next question uh, may resonate with what you just talked about. Rebecca Holden asks, uh, well, she says, I teach the professional writing class writing for nonprofits here at UMD. Any advice you have regarding writing for those who want to go into nonprofit work? So I've written, I've written, been writing grants for a long time. I think the only advice that I have is to remember you're writing to a human. <laughs> remember <laughs> that a lot of times we talk about this technical writing and we're writing to this abstract idea and, per, and thing. Um, I think it's also thinking through how can you write in a way that connects to the person, the reader, um, in an emotional way, um, in an academic way. And so to make sure that you include a not shy away from sharing the story of who you're talking about. Um, um, and it also is honoring their their experience, right? They're not just a data point. Um, and so in writing, it's how do you, how can you honor the community that you're writing about um, by sharing their story, by uplifting their story? Um, and also then taking stock of who is the reader? Um, you know, if you're able to write one story within your entire grant proposal and that person really connects to that story, they may forgive or overlook that you had a deficit last year. Um, because they're able to connect and see, oh, well, maybe you ran a deficit because you were helping people who are in need. And I can really connect and see, okay, well, it's this person might have come to one workshop. So they're not just one of seven people who came to the workshop. They have a name and they have a story behind it. 
And I think that's great for any students who are English majors or journalism majors that you can apply your skills, your talents to Asian American nonprofits, right? The ability to tell a story in a compelling way clearly uh, is I think needed by a lot of organizations. And that I think connects with Marjorie's question, one of my students. Um, Marjorie says, thank you, Mr. S uh, Saxena. This was a great lecture. I'm curious about how you and your organization are recording all of your work. Is it archived, documented? Uh, preserving Asian American histories has been on my mind lately, especially with Corky Lee's passing. And this might be the last question uh, being asked. So I wish I had a good answer for you, but most of the times it's probably in a box somewhere in an office. Um, <laughs> You know, I think I don't. I don't think. Um, I think we're we're doing a better job at it now, and there are different um, efforts around preserving our history. Um, and, uh, but I think at this point, for many nonprofits, there are a lot of pressures, and this idea of preserving um, is is not as as salient um, in the minds of leadership or staff. And I and I think it is something that's important and critical um, to have, um, you know, a Smithsonian on, for Asian Americans um, would be a, a place that um, would provide support and encourage this type of work and provide, um, how do you, sorry, <laughs> uh, how do you, oh, how do you archive um, different things? Um, but you know, for many nonprofits, it's it's, it's going to be a challenge um, to find you know what happened before, and once you lose some institutional knowledge, also that is a challenge um, to keep it. So I think great question, um, and something that uh, that now, as you move into the more digital space, maybe st more stuff can be preserved. But um, a lot of older stuff um, was a challenge, and you know, even when as we talked about Corky, a lot of his first stuff was on film. And film, you know, degrades over it, it goes away over time. And so, is it being digitized? And how can we preserve all of that? Um, are things that are important questions that we need to answer? Great. Um, and maybe, uh, do you want to end this on maybe a little bit more about uh, Corky's work uh, within the context of what it means to be a leader, even though he was behind the camera most of the time? Um, I mean, in what ways has Corky's documentation, archiving of Asian America uh, maybe helped influence the way you think about what it means to be uh, a leader? I, I think, I think Terry, you already mentioned this a little bit. It's, it's being seen. I think, you know, we, we talk about and, and this idea within our community about how representation matters. And, um, you know, a lot of that is, we all see and grew up with our family pictures and we've seen that, and that is our context. Um, <clears throat> but then to be able to see other Asian Americans across the country, to be able to connect, oh, you know what? Someone in, in the Bay Area, you know, looks like me, is doing the same thing I'm doing. Well, I, I have that connection. There's, there's, there's a, a shared experience that, that I gained from seeing the photos. I think that was one thing. And I think the other thing is, is learning. I learned so much from what was happening in these different areas that I could see um, <clears throat> that, that with a photo I could gain so much from. Um, and so I gained encouragement and, and support through the photos that there are other people doing this work, hustling out there, um, you know, on the front lines, you can see their faces. Um, and I think that is, that was comforting um, to know that it wasn't just my family, my neighborhood, my community, but it's across this country. Mm. Thanks for that. And um, I mean, I think that touches on and, and a couple of folks asked about uh, what it means to build an inclusive environment in a nonprofit space. And I think that comes down to being seen, right? Mm -hmm. um, cultivating those spaces of belonging uh, and nonprofit work and, and photography and art uh, can do that as well. 
think we're out of time. Um, sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, but um, I learned so much uh, from your talk. So uh, let's give another virtual round of applause uh, to Neil. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, a quick plug for uh, the Do Good Institute, which I, I think um, is, uh, has done some work with Fair Chance. Uh, they have a graduate certificate in nonprofit management and leadership. And I'll drop the link right there. And there's a little blurb I am to read about uh, the certificate. Um, if you're looking to accelerate your social impact career, but don't want to complete a master's program, consider UMD's online graduate certificate in nonprofit management and leadership. The graduate certificate prepares students to excel in leading people as well as nonprofit strategy, finances, and fundraising. The faculty have decades of real world experience and will help you gain knowledge and skills that you can apply to, jo to your job. This program is quick. You can complete it in under a year, but challenging. And they're now accepting applications for the fall 2021 semester. And you can go to that link that I dropped into the chat box for more information. Um, yeah, so hopefully some of you, if you weren't already thinking of uh, going into the nonprofit sector, now you have some really great uh, lessons and, and insights that you can apply to your particular journey. Um, so thank you again. Chanani also thanks you uh, in the chat box. And uh, yeah, uh, hope everyone stays safe. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.